Okay. Ooh. So we're good to go. All right, so let me see. <clears throat> and the way we're going to um, do the introductions is um, I'll just give you guys the floor. And then, so I'll start out and just kind of, let's see. Let's see this. So when we get to um, slide number slide number two, um, I'll give you guys the floor, and then you guys can go ahead and just talk a little bit about, you know, um, like your name, I guess your name, where you teach, and what you teach, and uh, and yeah. And then, um, and I hope that that works. So. <clears throat> We have eight minutes. Hey, JR, I'm not going to throw those slides in. After all, there were some backgrounds. I was just going to copy them over from another slide deck, but um, I can just talk about it. Okay, that's good. So, easier. Yeah, I mean, I don't want you to have to, like, you know. Yeah. I don't want you to have to work, man. You're already doing work. <laughs> You're hanging out with me tonight. <laughs> this is not work. This is fun. What are you talking about? <laughs> this, this is... This is uh, if you guys know Jed Butler, who's Jed? Oh, hey, Jed! Oh, ho! Junior. What's going on? <laughs> Christine, and Jared's out in Vegas. And Ed. What's yeah. up, Jed? Oh, man, Jed, dude. We're doing things that suck in a little bit third round. Awesome. Are you yep. going to be part of that too, Jed? Nice. I'll come, jo I'll come join as soon as this is over. <laughs> That's awesome. You know, it's kind of cool that we all know each other. And <laughs> some of us have never seen each other actually in person. Um, but it's, actually, it's so cool. Like, I love this, like community and how, um, how connected we all are. I made it a point last summer to actually make sure that we all kind of got together and um, like met and uh, so I just invited everybody over to my house and then everyone. Uh, that was for the, you did that for uh, Rockstar, right? A little barbecue. Oh, someone's playing the, some, uh oh. Who's playing the, um, wait, hold on. Is that me? It is me, isn't it? Hold on. <laughs> Sorry, that was me. <clears throat> um, so, wait, what was that, Dan, you were saying? You did, you get, the barbecue was around the time of uh, Manhattan Beach, right? The yes, it was, it yeah. was, um, I just want to get everybody together, if, since we were all in town. So, if you guys ever make it down to SoCal, you know. Well, Christine, she lives in um, she lives in SoCal, but hey, if you're ever in the Huntington Beach area, always come by. You're always uh, welcome. Dan like it's makes a very himself, nice coffee bean. He always uh, he always comes by, so, <laughs> when, he, when he can. He's got a, he's got a little kiddo though, so he's got to make sure. Two. So. Two little kiddos. Oh yeah, That's, right. wife is gonna kill me. <laughs> <laughs> Two little kiddos. They're at Disney today. Oh, they are. Very yeah. Nice. It's raining. Well, uh, kind of. Not kind really. Of. Yeah, I'm supposed to join them after this, so I gotta drive home from Paris, meet them at Disney, help her with dinner. Yeah. That's a long day. Yeah, and I gotta turn in my homework tonight. Oh. Oh, for uh, that's yeah. right for your take for the yeah. classes that you're taking. Yeah. yeah. So. Good times. Fun times. Fun times. All right, let me get my resources yeah. in order. Um, I don't want any other windows open. I do have the additional resources available. Um. Okay. Uh, I already have the YouTube video ready to go. So I think, hold on a second. You guys can, I just, when I just clicked on that YouTube app, you guys saw that, right? Which one? Um, I just clicked on the YouTube app mm -hmm. on the Hangout. Can you guys see the video screen or no? No. No? Okay, hold on. Let me go to the live feed. Let me see that. 
Hold on. Now I gotta make sure that that's on. Actually, you know, I'm gonna. I need to. I'm gonna need this. Yeah, app. Yeah, it's not that right. Good All right, we got like uh, we got like four minutes, three minutes. Uh, I just clicked on the YouTube app. <coughs> on Can you guys see the video? Hey, hey Jr. I I did throw. Sorry, I did throw one slide in there. It was a cool. Um, just because uh, I helped a, a friend out with her third grader. She did a, he did a scratch animation about Isaac Newton. Oh, awesome. So I just had a couple images because I thought that was the coolest thing I'd ever seen. Yeah, no, no yeah, again, that's why but you that have to hear man. So, no, that's good. Sorry for waffling. No, 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 not at all. Um, I want you guys, like, you know, again, like, I don't know everything, so, but I, and that's why I brought you in, because I know that you guys do a lot. And, hold on a second. What's that? Okay, I thought I can prime this. You guys see the video now? No. No? Here, let me just play it really quick. You guys don't see it, huh? Ah, gosh. I knew this was going to happen. Okay, hold on. Let me do that again. Um, how is this going to work? How is this going to work? Did you guys see the video, or at least hear the audio? No, no video, no audio, huh? Uh, all right. I got the audio, just no video. Uh, anyone else hear the audio? <clears throat> no audio. Very quietly. Okay, hold on a second. All right, I'm going to need to figure this out. I may have to invite myself in. No, that's not going to work, no, is it? No video, no audio, huh? Uh, all right. I've got the audio, just no video. Uh, anyone else hear the audio? OK, don't worry about it. Um, I will. Can you just no put audio. it in a very quietly? Can you put it in a window, like play it off of your Chrome and just mirror your screen? I know, but then the audio still won't play. Oh, you're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, it's okay. If if I can play it, that would be great, and then we'll see what happens. I may be able to actually do it as soon as we go on. All right. I think we're just about to go on live. Um, we're supposed to part, start about a minute or a couple minutes after 10.30. So just to get everyone to the hangout and then we'll have that discussion. So it's 10.30 now, and it looks like we're on. Let me just make sure. So we'll start up in about a minute, give some people time to get in. It looks like, um, I don't know if you guys can see the viewer feed, and it looks like there's five people in now. Uh, in addition to the five of you, or the four of you, so which is great. Um, let me go ahead and mute.
Okay. Uh, let's see. I've got 1031, so I'll start in another 30 seconds. Give people to get in. Um, can you guys see the uh, broadcast feed? It looks like there may be about 16 people in. Okay. Let's see. All right, let's go on live, and we're here. Um, let's do the welcome, and let's get this party started. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is J.R. Genix Serenian. Um, I've been, uh, I'm honored to be part of uh, Education on Air's conference today, um, and I've been, I, it's a, a pleasure to be here with you uh, and to share with you um, some knowledge about what digital storytelling in the science classroom would sort of look like. Um, I've invited some people to be part of the Hangout, um, as you can see down at the bottom. And um, today we're going to do a little bit of science as well. Um, let me go ahead and start with the presentation, and uh, we'll do some introductions in a second. Okay. All right, so this is digital storytelling in the science classroom. Again, my name is J.R. Genix Serenian. I'm a Google certified teacher and a Google education trainer as well. Um, let's do some introductions with the people that are in the room uh, and a little bit of housekeeping. Um, there is a Q&A section if you go to the events page uh, on uh, g.co slash education on air. So if you have any questions as we're going through the session, feel free to drop them into there, and um, one of our um, uh, one of the people in the Hangout can actually uh, um, you know, read the questions out loud uh, at near the end of the uh, session, and um, we'll try to answer them the best that we can. So why don't we go ahead and introduce ourselves and take time to do that. Um, if you could, uh, for every person in the Hangout, uh, go ahead and um, introduce yourself. So we'll start out with Christine. Christine, could you tell us, um, uh, again, well, introduce yourself and then where you teach? Sure. And what I'm, you teach. I'm Christine Hartuni. I teach seventh grade science, life science, at Palm Desert Charter Middle School in Southern California. I'm a Q Innovative Educator and also a Leading Edge Certified in Blended and Online Instruction. Okay, thank you, Christine. Uh, Dan, go ahead. Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Dan Bennett. I teach uh, biology at Los Alamitos High School in Southern California. I'm also a GCT and GET like uh, JR, and I also uh, work as an ed tech coach. So I'm really happy to be part of this. Great. Thanks, Dan. Uh, ed, why don't you go ahead? Uh, hi, my name's Ed Campos. I'm a math and technology teacher at an independent study high school in Visalia, California. Uh, I'm also a Q innovative educator like Christine, um, leading edge blended online instructor, and a Google educator. Uh, thanks, Ed. And then Jared, go ahead and introduce yourself. I'm Jared Bartishan. I'm an ed tech coach for the Southern Nevada Regional Professional Development Program in Las Vegas, and I am also a Google certified teacher and trainer. All right, great. Um, I'm sharing my screen again, and then we'll move on. And start talking about digital storytelling. All right, good. So let's start out with a number. Um, all right, so the reason why you see this number is 7.9%. Let's start that off. Okay, according to the National Center of Education Statistics, of all the degrees conferred in the U.S., natural sciences only actually takes up this percentage of all the degrees that are awarded. And um, it's been on a steady decline since 1970. This number actually is lower than the percentage of computer science majors uh, at the moment. Um, um, there was actually a spike in the year of, uh, school year of 1995-1996. Um, I don't know if anyone would um, know the reason why, but I think that was about the time when ER came out, and I don't know if you guys remember when uh, ER came out, everybody wanted to become a doctor. 
Um, so, uh, but today, uh, it's actually lower. Okay, again, it's lower than the computer uh, sciences and engineering degrees that get awarded. So, how is it that we can go ahead and um, engage more students to study the hard sciences? How do we increase student interest and curiosity about the natural world and the universe? And I actually have a pretty easy question. I think it's actually easier than what people might think, and it's yes, it's tell better stories. Um, and as teachers, as well as getting you know, as teachers as well as getting our students to tell better stories about what they observe, we want them to um, tell better stories about their hypotheses, about what they found out, and also what um, they've learned and how they've felt after doing these experiments or doing these activities. So let me give you guys a quick example. So everybody knows what this image looks like, all right? What this image is. Obviously, it's the periodic table. Now I want you guys to think back. So imagine the first time you saw this image in a classroom and imagine um, what you or how it was introduced to you and think about um, what you remember from learning the periodic table at that time. Your teacher probably went ahead and described the periodic table as these is the periodic table of elements. Here are the first 20 that I'm going to ask you guys to memorize. It's ordered according to atomic number. Um, you know, these are all you know great characteristics of this, but it doesn't actually describe the beauty of how the periodic table is arranged. So instead of giving you factoids about the periodic table, why don't I go ahead and try to tell you a story about it? Okay, and maybe embody what. Uh, certain scientists had actually had to go through in order to put this thing together, in order to organize it. So here's some cards, and as you can see, that there's uh, different shapes, there's different quantities of shapes, uh, and there's even different shades of all those different shapes that are present in all those cards. And so, let's say that I commission you as a scientist to go ahead, or just even as a student. Go ahead and organize these cards in a grid sort of fashion with columns and rows. And you would spend a little bit of time to go ahead and put that together. Now it may look something like this, where you kind of put the different shades of white and gray and black on you know different parts of that. So columns and rows, but this still doesn't look I mean it looks organized, but there isn't some kind of any logic uh, associated with this. So I may ask you again to go ahead and spend a little bit of time organizing it. And you may go ahead and organize it in this fashion, where you're putting the ovals on one side, the rectangles maybe in the middle, the diamonds over there on the side. And note that there's no right or wrong way to organize it, but there is some kind of logical way to organize this. Now, it still doesn't look right. So what? I'll probably ask you to do is to go ahead and try to figure out another way to organize it and maybe give you a little bit of insight, you know, uh, maybe kind of egg you on a little bit to try to improve the organization. And so there was a um, scientist, his name was Mendeleev, and he struggled with this. He knew that certain <coughs> elements had existed, but uh, he had all of these different elements with all these different characteristics. And he began to see certain trends, and he tried to put these trends in, this, uh, in some kind of logical order. Where he put, you know, maybe ones across the top, twos in the middle, threes down at the bottom, and then there was repeating patterns. But his genius was to actually do this. He realized that even though he had all these different puzzle pieces um, laid out, there may have been some elements that haven't been discovered yet. So his genius was to actually leave spaces for every single one of those elements that probably um, would fit in a specific space but hadn't been discovered yet. So if I kind of point to the third column down at the bottom, even though I left a space right there, you would know that that would be three ovals that are completely black, okay? And all three ovals that are side, uh, uh, you know, all next to each other. If I point at um, the second row, the first box underneath in that second row, that would be two ovals that are white. So because I organized it in that way, now you can definitely see the logical pattern. And notice that there's this repeating pattern. It goes white, gray, black, white, gray, black. And if you go back to the periodic table, that's how this periodic table was actually organized. It's organized according to repeating trends. 
So now that you know have a little bit of a background about how that periodic table was organized, and because you, I told you a story about how it was put together, it's probably a little bit more memorable, and now you'll be able to appreciate the beauty of what the periodic table actually, uh, or and how it's put together with the repeating patterns and trends. Now, you may be asking yourself, you know, in science, why should I bother telling stories? Well, here's the thing. I just told you a story about the struggle of a scientist, and I think what stories embody is it embodies the struggle that scientists have to go through and that science is actually a process. Let's just kind of go through, um, you know, I have a friend. His name's Destin. Uh, he's got a YouTube channel called Smarter Every Day. Um, we communicate once in a while back and forth. He asked, uh, he asked me for a favor once, and I helped him out, and uh, I asked him for a favor and so forth. And um, I love the stories that he tells in his YouTube channel. And the stories that he tell. I asked him one question at some point, you know, why tell stories in science? And he said that people were made to interact with other people, and telling stories in science actually is a good way to convey emotion from one person to another. And I thought that was actually quite um, succinct and brilliant at the same time. And that people were made to interact with other people, and the way we interact with one another is through story. And so I have three reasons in why uh, I believe that stories actually work in science really well. The first one is, um, is that people make connections with stories. And teaching science can sometimes get bogged down with the language, um, uh, the facts, the theories, and the numbers. Uh, but stories actually can spark a person's curiosity. And here's the thing. People are innately curious. They always want to know why things are the way they are and how things work. And in fact, this is prevalent in children. So children are always curious, and I think that that's one way for us to be able to uh, you know, tap into that curiosity and tap into that drive. Now, I've learned to teach a periodic table. I actually tried to teach a periodic table to junior high kids by showing them the periodic table first and talking about you know, how um, you know, this is hydrogen, the first element, helium, the second element. And you can definitely, I don't know if you can relate to this, but I remember seeing their eyes glaze over in about five minutes and maybe even less. Um, but if you try to reframe the lesson in some kind of campfire story, I think that most students will gravitate towards that. And I think that st suddenly the students are sort of the edge of their seat. If you engage them in some way, uh, and that uh, activity that I just showed you, uh, at some point what I did was I actually cut out the cards and then have them actually experience and put those cards together in a grid sort of fashion. And we had a discussion about you know why they arranged it in a certain way. And you've, I'm sure you guys have seen different arrangements of the periodic table. Um, and so there's no right or wrong way to arrange it, but there is some kind of logic to the, how it's arranged because there are repeating trends and there are repeating patterns within these elements. And the great thing about you know telling stories, again, is that people can connect with it. Um, and uh, and definitely connect with you know again the struggle um, you know uh, going through the process of actually you know organizing information and maybe even the process of discovery. Now, the other thing, the other reason why I think that stories are actually important in science is because uh, biologically, um, it actually is very very. Um, uh, connected, and the stories actually affect the brain. Um, there's this great infographic, and I put that on the resources page from the Google Plus um, uh, page, that uh, from uh, uh, a, from the uh, New York Times, I believe, is that the stories activate the part of the brain that allows a listener to turn the story into their own ideas, into their own, into their own experience, and that um, the brain actually releases dopamine into the system when an experience is an emotionally charged event. Um, and so if they're listening to a, a story that they can um, relate to emotionally, it makes it easier for them to remember and actually um, remember with greater accuracy. And that also a well-told story can engage many areas of the brain. And that includes, you know, controlling motor function, senses, and definitely the frontal lobe, which is involved in problem solving. So. Uh, they've already done these studies, and they know that storytelling affects the brain in some capacity. And if we can um, uh, activate certain regions of the brain by telling stories, and most likely students will be able to remember, because it becomes experiential to them. They actually are not only be able to relate, but they sort of um, mirror 
the same experience that the storyteller is actually uh, narrating. And here's the third thing. And that science is a process. And just like stories are a process. There's, you know, a beginning, a middle, uh, and sometimes there's an end, sometimes there's not. Just like science. Most science actually begins with questions. Something like this. Uh, what, what if it was possible for us to go ahead and uh, what if we really wanted to go ahead and go to the moon? What is it possible for us to land something on uh, a comet? Uh, you know, that's millions and millions of miles away. How does something work? And asking these questions uh, again sparks curiosity. And then, because we're asking these great questions, it leads to exploration, which then leads to experiments and leads to discovery, and then inevitably leads to innovation. And it's funny because sometimes um, at some point in my uh, uh, teaching career, I've asked students, you know, which subjects are the least creative? Usually near the top, if not on the top of the list of the creative subjects. But I actually would disagree. I think that, um, in fact, science is quite creative. It may just be it's not presented in that way that opens people's minds about how to creatively problem solve situations or uh, how to creatively creatively uh, come up with um, uh, some problem-solving techniques. So, all right, well, if that's the case, uh, hopefully I've sold you on the idea of storytelling is great in science. Well, how do we go ahead and do this? So let me give you an example of uh, an activity that I've done with some students. Here's a graph of position versus time. So <clears throat> I'll give a student a prompt. I'll say, this is they're a dog and their owner and they're playing in the front yard. And what I need for you to do is to describe what the dog's doing okay, at every single given point on the graph. And I'll put this actually in the Google drawing and I'll send it out via Doctopus or Google Classroom. But instead of actually telling me the story via text, I want them to actually insert images to tell their story. And so this is what it would look like. So as you can see, these are images pulled from the research toolbar in Google Drawings. And I went ahead and asked them to go ahead and type out a piece of text. And so now they're using images to be able to tell the story. And then and if it somehow mirrors whatever's on the graph, I can tell right away that they were able to understand the components of it. For example, there's a horizontal region right there where um, between 10 and 15 seconds. That means that the dogs probably stopped at that point. And it's probably picking up the stick, so that's where about C is, okay, or uh, at least in the uh, on the icons that you see. Here's another graph, and I'll say, you know what, this is uh, a graph of a bee in the garden. Now explain to me what the bee is actually doing. And here's another example of what they were able to produce. So not only did they go ahead and type text into it, but they used the research toolbar to go ahead and bring images and icons into there to help explain what the behavior of the bee is. So now they're telling stories about what they see, the data that they've actually, uh, this is not data that they've gathered, it's just something that I've went ahead and produced for them, and then I asked them to go ahead and tell me what that is. And the great part about this is there's different ways for them to go ahead and explain it, um, and it really gives them the opportunity to think about like how they're going to deliver that. Uh, here's another one. Okay, So I gave my students, my freshman students, a science project, and I told them, you know what? Um, I'm gonna. We're going over simple machines, and I want you guys to go ahead and build a Rube Goldberg machine. A Rube Goldberg machine is a ridiculous machine that does that does a simple task. So um, you need to include all the six simple machines that we're studying. Um, but the problem was I was in a small classroom, in a small lab classroom. If I had 180 students, there's no way for me to store all of those Rube Goldberg machines in my classroom. So how do I go about, uh, you know, having them build this? So I said, you know what, you're going to have to build it at home, but here's the deal. You're going to have to film yourselves actually running the Rube Goldberg machine. But not only that, but you have to identify the six different simple machines within your Rube Goldberg machine that we're covering. So not only did they have to explain how the machine was working, they had to identify the components and then even identify this is a, this is a lever, it's a second class lever and so forth. So let me go ahead and show you a video, YouTube video of what some of my students had actually produced.
and at the end right there is them screaming um, because it finally had worked and it was um, uh, I think it was about 12:30 in the uh, in the evening when they actually got it to work finally. So let me go ahead and uh, get back into the presentation. So now I'm going to go ahead and pose this question out to the people that are in the Hangout. Um, and I, I, these are teachers I respect. So are there any other ways that you use technology and storytelling in your classes? Um, and then let me go ahead and stop sharing. Uh, does anyone want to go ahead and chime in? Um, so I'm not a science teacher, but I have helped. Uh, can you hear me, Jared? Yeah, I can hear you. You're fine, Ed. I have helped a couple of uh, my colleagues with, with some stuff. You know, we have a uh, a plan to uh, use some video and some time lapse using like an iMotion app uh, to 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 shoot a uh, a, met a fast maturing plant uh, within his classroom and edit it and narrate. And then I also <coughs> Uh, in one of the slides, I helped a student uh, use Jing to, not Jing, but Snagit to screencast a animation that they made with Scratch, and it was a, it was a third grade student's project on Isaac Newton's uh, Laws of Motion, which is really cool, so they were using coding, created the animation, uh, told a story, and then I helped my friend who uh, teaches in Southgate, uh, we did a hangout with her class and showed uh, showed the student how to narrate it using uh, Snagit. So that was pretty cool. Cool. Thanks, Ed. Anybody else? Yeah, JR, um, some of the things that I've done the past couple years with, with teachers here in Las Vegas is uh, share a concept uh, called Google Trex created by Dr. Alice Christie uh, out of Arizona. And that's challenging all teachers in uh, all areas and grade levels to uh, put a story on a map. So whether you're talking about math concepts or science concepts, uh, tell that story and, and use a little geography with it uh, as well. But you know, as we were talking about this, uh, I thought of a, a personal tie as well. When I applied for the Google Teacher Academy, I had a topic that I had to create a two-minute video on, and it had to be very, very personal. And I had to tell this story about this topic, and I thought that was a, a great way for me to learn a whole lot about the topic, number one, but to dig deep inside myself to see how it related to me. So. That's good. Thanks, Jared. Um, anybody else? Uh, for me, from my students, um, they they get to work in the garden for their whole seventh grade year. So I have them tell their own story of how they um, developed their plot, what they needed to do to get it going, and what were the different um, processes that, that they saw in their plants that related back to the classroom. What were those uh, different tropisms that they saw evidence of in their plants and then finally at the end you know um, just kind of giving a wrap up and what did they learn that year and that whole experience. That's good. Thanks Christine for sharing. Um, okay so let me just go back to the presentation um, and uh, you know what let's do this. Um, since I'm a science teacher and I love demos I'm gonna go ahead and uh, do a science experiment with you. And I'm going to do this um, live, so we're going to see, if we'll make sure, like, uh, I'm hoping that it works. It should work. Um, all right. Let me go ahead and make sure you guys can see. So that's just a paper plate. Can everybody see the camera? Uh, the paper plate? Okay, good, thanks. So I just prepped it. So I just poured some, uh, that's food coloring in some water. Um, and then there's a candle that's in the middle of a paper plate. This is your normal everyday penny. So, and I actually do this to teach um, uh, the differences between a control and a variable in an experiment and to talk about what trials are. So I'll go ahead and do a science. So here we go. All right. So <laughs> let's make sure. So the penny's sitting right there. I've got a clear bottle right here. And I'll ask the kids a question. I'll say, what is it, what's going to happen to the candle when I cover the candle up with the bottle upside down like this? And most people will say, yeah, well, obviously the candle's going to go out. But something else happens, and I hope that you guys are going to be able to see this. Let's try it. Yeah. 
and the candle's gone out. Um, but something else happened. And as you can see, the water actually went right into the bottle uh, and uh, went up at a higher level. So we'll actually do that again, and then just to make sure that it works again. And it sort of embodies you know, doing the trials over and over again to make sure that uh, you get the same result. And then I'll ask the kids another question. I'll say, well, what if you want to go ahead and try to um, try something different? I'll say, okay, what if, um, what if you tried a different coin? Or maybe if you tried, instead of the head side, you would try the tail side. Or maybe without the coin. And then the kids will start, you know, and then I'll ask them questions. Well, you know, what do you expect to happen? And then they'll come up with some, you know, answers and so forth. And I'll say, well, how about this? I want you guys to write down your observations, and then I'm going to have you guys go ahead and try it. So they'll try it without the coin, with the coin, and then I have to let them know, well, you need to make sure that you only change one thing at a time. Because if you change two things at the same time, you don't know if the wa and the water went all the way up or higher than the level that you see at the moment, you know, you don't know which um, thing caused that change. So now they have to actually think about that. And so, and then some people will ask, well, can we try two candles? And I'll say, well, I didn't say you couldn't. And so they'll keep trying. And what that does is it embodies, one, the ability for, you know, for students to go ahead and keep trying different things. It teaches them the difference between a variable and a, a control during an experiment. And it also, you know, and then I'll ask them to go ahead and write something or either, you know, create a Google drawing, take a photograph of this, and then have them create a flow chart. You know, did the water start to go up before the candle went out? Did it start to go up? you know, um, after only the, the candle went out and so forth. And then, you know, I'll actually have them film it and then they'll have them explain it. So that's just to leave you guys with a little bit of a, a you know, a quick demo to maybe start the year in the fall. And, um, you know, and a good way to sort of teach, you know, again, trials and experiments and controls and variables. Um, and uh, it's actually really easy to put together. It's uh, really inexpensive, and um, it actually is quite a really deep sort of discussion that you can have with these students before you actually start the year. So we're coming to the end of our uh, uh, of the broadcast. Um, Dan, do you have any questions actually that came up on the uh, Q and A section? Uh, I don't see any questions posted right now. I don't know that if I don't know whether or not uh, people were able to find that event page with the uh, with the Q and A section. That's okay, no big deal. But um, well, it's about eleven o'clock right now on my uh, my clock. I want to value your time. So, thank you uh, for coming to the uh, um, the session today on Stand Back. I'm about to do digital storytelling in science. Thank you to the people that are in the hangout: Christine, Daniel, Ed, and Jared. I I owe you a lot for for being here. Uh, thank you for your wisdom and thank you for sharing um, your experiences with digital storytelling in your environments. And uh, enjoy the rest of the Education On Air conference for the rest of the day. Thank you.